think we are on around pages 28 and 29. Um, yeah, we were. We left off with um, Aden or Aiden telling Taryn uh, that they had to, that he finally had to plow the field with his Eden, with his um, bare hands, okay? And so picking up, um, let's see. Skip the rest of that chapter, except for the very last couple of paragraphs. Taryn helps them, and on page 30, Eden says to him, You have been well taught in the ways of farming. If you seek a place of welcome, you've already found one. Okay? So this is the first place, bear in mind, this is the first place Taryn visits as he goes off to find himself. He's going to leave from here, and he's going to go on visit other people, other places, and in each of those situations, he's going to receive a welcome, okay? and he's going to do something that kind of initiates that welcome. Chapter 3, we go on, and we uh, the chapter's titled, Gorion and Guest, okay? Those are two of the lords who were um, involved in the destruction of Eden's farm. And we're going to see that again later on. But I want to point out on page, where is that? Page 34. Um, Taryn before then, gets attacked, etc. And on 34, he meets the Lord of the men who have attacked him. And we're told, Gorion says that his men are heroes, all of them, to stand against six giants. Terrence, giants? Giants indeed. It will not be forgotten how the brave riders of Gorion the Valorous were beset by enemies, outnumbered two to one, by worse than giants, for one was a fierce monster with sharp claws and fangs, that's Gurgi. Another carried an oak tree in his fist and swept it about him as if it were no more than a twig. Okay, that's Eden. Okay? So we we get introduced to Gorion, and Gorion, as we'll guess after him, has a particular fault. He takes pride in something. And I'm not saying that the pride is the fault. It's he takes pride in kind of false valor. That is, he ascribes to his men a valor that isn't real. And he takes great pride in that, even though he believes the valor is real. So, Taryn points out to him, there were no giants, there was no monster, it was myself, a farmer, and Gurgi. Okay. Gorion has a hard time believing that. We're told, page 36, um, the face of the cantor Lord had begun to furrow in deep perplexity. He shifted his bulk and said, shadows, you mean to shadow the bravery of those who serve me? And Taryn says, no, 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 no. Because Taryn realizes what's going on with Gorion. And so he's trying to argue or... to create a word, diplomatize a way out, to diffuse the situation. He says, if your warriors believed they had seen what they claimed and fought accordingly, their bravery is no less. If they thought they had actually seen a giant and a monster and they still fought, then he says, their bravery is no less. It is every bit as great as their truthfulness. Okay? These are no more than words. Show me deeds. There is no creature on four hooves that I cannot ride. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So Taryn goes on, keeps talking with Gorion, and Fluter shows up. Page 39 and following. 
We're going to skip a bunch of that. And we go on to um, guest. Second kind of half of the chapter. Dorian takes pride in valor. What does guest take pride in? Louder? Generosity. But as with Gorion's troops' valor, describe guests' generosity. Yeah, it's not real. It's as real as Gorion's troops fighting monsters and giants and such. Okay? We're told, page 41, Guest says to Terran and Gurgi, pushing a small bunch, a hunch of gravy spotted bread toward them and keeping the rest for himself, eat your fill. Guest generous is ever open handed. Okay, eat your fill. Kind of implies what? All you can eat until you are done eating. But how much does he give them? Just a tiny bit. Okay? And then he calls himself. Guess the generous. Terran, generous? I think he'd make a miser seem a prodigal in comparison. Prodigal there means overly generous. That someone who is, who is um, so generous with their stuff, they just give it all away. Okay? So, Gast loudly urges his companions to stuff themselves while offering them no more than a few morsels of stringy meat, etc., etc. And Taryn wants to go off. Okay. So we're going to skip a bunch more. Gas talks about his cattle. He talked about, you know, uh, Cornillo, the finest cow in the land. In the end of the chapter, page 44, okay, Gas, you know, sends them off and tells them, at the stronghold of Gas the Generous, you'll ever find an open-handed welcome. Taryn replies, not to Gas, but he replies to Fluter as they start to leave. It's a generosity that could starve us to death. And he tells us, Gas thinks himself open-handed, as Gorion thinks himself valorous. As far as I can judge, neither one has the truth of it. That is, neither one really knows the truth of generosity and valor, bravery. But they both seem pleased with themselves. Hmm. Is a man truly what he sees himself to be? Well, he asks that question because he wants to know what he truly is. He wants to know his identity. So is Gast truly generous, because that's what he thinks himself to be? Is Gorion truly brave because that's what he considers himself to be. Fluter says, in response to Terran's statement, only if what he sees is true. That is, he is what he is only if what he thinks about himself is true. So there has to be some kind of self-awareness there. If there's too great a difference between his own opinion and the fact, well, you know, then I should say that such a man had more, no more substance to him than Corian's giants. In ancient Greece, there's an oracle at Delphi that apparently, so the Greeks thought, Apollo the god spoke to him. Okay? Oracle's like a prophet. And outside the temple of the oracle, there was inscribed on a stone two words. Know thyself. There's another motto too, but this was one of them. Okay? Know thyself. What's it mean? Socrates was told, you're the wisest man in the world. He said, get out of here. I can't be with you. And so what did he do? He starts walking around asking people questions. Because he wants to prove that Jamari is wiser than he is. And so he goes up to Jamari, he starts asking Jamari a bunch of questions, and he realizes he doesn't know anything more than I do. Okay? I'm not the wisest man in the world. He goes around everybody, all the quote unquote wise men, and proves they're damn fools. Okay? 
He says, I'm not the wisest man in the world. Why? I know that I don't know anything. That's what made him the wisest man in the world. He knew himself. Okay? If you read the dialogues of Plato, which tell us what Socrates taught and such, one of Socrates' most famous aphorisms or sayings is the unexamined life is not worth living. In other words, if you never think about why you are here, you're taking up extra air. You're taking up air that somebody more useful than you could be using. The unexamined life is not worth living. Okay? What's Karen talking about here? Self-examination. And Fluter says, what? If what you see and what you believe about yourself is true, then, to go back to Karen's statement, a man truly is what he sees himself to be. But if it's not true, how do you know if it's not true? If there's a great difference between his opinion and the facts. If, if I were to tell you, you know, something like uh, some stupid trivia thing. You know, I knew every baseball team that won the World Series going back to the beginning of the World Series. And I went on and on and on about how important that was and how significant it was. And I knew all those facts, et cetera, et cetera. And Ashlyn said, okay, tell me who won the World Series in 1937. And I didn't have the answer. What would you immediately think? I'm lying. <clears throat> the truth, the facts, would not accord with what I said. Therefore, from what Fluter says, then that man has no more substance to him if he's full of lies okay, than Gorion's giants. Well, how much substance was there to the giants that attacked Gorion's men? None. It wasn't even not much. It was none. Okay. So, Fluter then goes on. But don't judge them too harshly. These cantor nobles are much alike. Prickly as porcupines, friendly as puppies. They all hoard their possessions, yet they can be generous to a fault if the mood strikes them. As for valor, they're no cowards. So notice, they will be generous. They're not cowards. So what have Gorion and Gas done, however? They've taken that little bit of valor they have and blown it up to be everything. They've taken that little bit of generosity, blown it up to be everything. Now, Bill mentioned exaggeration. Who within these novels so far tends to exaggerate a little bit too much? Beginning from the first book on. Fluter. And what happens every time he over-exaggerates? Bing! One of his harp strings breaks. Death rides in the saddle with them, they count it nothing. And in battle, I've seen them gladly lay down their lives for a comrade. Now, notice what Fluter's telling us here. He's ridden into battle with these guys. He's been around. At the same time, it's also been my experience and all my wanderings, that the further from the deed, the greater it grows. Why? What happens when you pass on a rumor? And that rumor gets passed on and it gets it grows and grows and grows. And the most glorious battle is the one longest past. Fluter. Had they harps like mine, what a din you'd hear from every stronghold in Britain. He's saying something about kind of the heroic society. You do something heroic and it it's blown up. Okay? A matter of cows. So, Karen goes off to Smoit. Now, we've already met Smoit. And Smoit says, never heard of the Mirror of Luna, page 46. 
He does know where the mountains are, where the witches said the mirror of Luna is, rises in the land of the free Kamats. Terry, I heard of them. Don't know anything else about them. So Fluter gives a little description. Little hamlets, villages, hasn't been there himself. Okay. And he says, Bagma 46, in law clay shaper is said to dwell among the common folk, as do many other craftsmen, master weavers, metalsmiths. Okay. Smoy, they're proud people, stiff necked. They bow to no captive lord, but only to the high king himself. Terra, what do you mean? What, 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 no lords? No kings? No chieftains over them? Well, who rules? Well, they rule themselves. In other words, they're small R Republicans. Okay? They do the work of the people themselves. They don't have somebody over them. Strong and steadfast. More peace and neighborliness in the free comets than anywhere else in Pradain, Smoit says. So why do they have needs for kings or lords? And Smoit then says, a king's strength lies in the will of those he rules. Well, what did Thomas Jefferson talk about in the Declaration of Independence? Where does government get its authority from? Specifically, Shelby's right, the people, the consent of the governed. And so what happens when the governed remove their consent? Okay. Revolution. That's what happens. Okay. Taryn says, huh, hadn't thought about that. Indeed, true allegiance is only given willingly. How do we know? How do we know that that is a true statement? Where do we see untrue, not true allegiance earlier in the novels? Louder? Morning. Okay. But even with Morgan, Gwydion says he only faltered at the end. Up until that point, up until he desired the Black Cauldron, he gave allegiance willingly. Who doesn't willingly give allegiance to a wrong? Cauldron, right? They get thrown into the cauldron, they come out, and what does Gwydion and Dalbin say? They no longer have any will. Okay. True allegiance is only given willingly. So, Smoit says, you can stay here for a while, we'll hunt, we'll feast, we'll make merry, blah, blah, blah. You'll put on some weight. Okay. And that's not going to last long because riders come from Gast, riders come from Gorion, they're getting ready to have it out. Smoit's going to, you know, teach them both a lesson. And he says, bottom of 49. When Terran asks, must we battle with Lord Gast? And if Lord Gorion's men have armed, we may be too few to stand against all of them. Smoint, battle? Ah, more's the pity. I'll have those troublemakers by the nose and in my dungeons before nightfall. In other words, I might not have their true allegiance, but I'm going to take control of them. They'll do as I command, top of 50. I'm their king by my beard. There's enough, there's broad enough here to make them remember it. In other words, Smoit says what? He'll subdue them by force. Terran, hmm, hold on, hold on. You yourself told me a king's true strength lay in the will of those he ruled. What? How's that? Don't puzzle me with my, don't, don't tell me what I said. Okay, Smoit is saying. Terran's like, hold on. I only mean, you've locked them up before, right? It's like the town drunk. You lock the town drunk, you know, old TV show. You lock the town drunk up every night, every week. Does it change the town drunk? No, it doesn't. Terran's getting at, you need to break this cycle. You need to break this pattern of behavior. 
right? Is there no way, no way to keep peace between them or make them understand? Smoy, I'll give them reasons, clutching his battle axe. Like in the old Peanuts cartoons, every now and then Lucy and her little brother Linus would be at, at some kind of disagreement. And Linus would essentially tell Lucy, well, why should I do that? And she'd say, I'll give you five good reasons. One, two, three, four, five. Force. And Linus would always reply, those are good reasons. She didn't argue. She's saying, I'll beat it in you. That's exactly what Smoik wants to do. Okay? But then he realizes, you struck on something, my lad. The dungeon's useless against that bear. So, messengers come in, fighting grows hotter and hotter, and Taryn says, page 52, if Gast and Gorion won't stop because their herds are lost, shouldn't we try to find the cows? Gurgi says, yes, yes. Okay. Page 53. Taryn again asks, and Smoit says, cows, there's more than cows in this, my lad. Such a brawl can spread like a spark through tinder. The, those thick skulled ruffians will set the whole of cattle for a blaze. And next thing you know, we'll all be at another's throats. In other words, Smoit's saying, if I don't put an end to this now, my position, my authority, my power is in danger. Okay? He says, the Lord's the next cantrip. They'll not stand idle. They'll strike against us. Why? They'll think they can control me. Taryn, but if we can get the cows, and Smoint sends them off, okay? So, next chapter, a judgment. Taryn's thinking, if I can find Cronillo, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom of 56, top of 57. Gurgi tells Taryn he hears the cows, okay? And we see Gurgi races towards him, and there's the herd, right in the middle of page 57, grazing calmly around Cornillo. Okay. So, Taryn says, let's drive the herd to Eden's farm. Your own herds must be tended better than we've done, because Smoint's injured. He says, take them where you want. They'll fetch Gaston and Dorian, etc., etc., there's Eden, bottom of 58, standing with a sword, getting ready to kill whomever. And Eden says, is this how you repay kindness? Do you come with them to spoil our land? Be gone. It is already done. Why? Well, what has happened? Everybody marches into Eden's field. That he's plowed how? With his bare hands. And then little those little green shoots, they're gone. Terrence like blah, blah, blah. Eden, does it matter really? Whose warriors? Trampled my crops. Whether it was Gorians or Gasts or, or King Smoints, doesn't matter. The crops are still dead. I'm gonna be hungry this winter. The harvest on which Eden had staked his livelihood would never come. And Taryn felt the farmer's heart break as if it were his home. Okay? Gas come in, comes in, Gorion comes in, they get ready. King uh, Smoit tells them to shut up. And Taryn goes up to Smoit with an idea. Bottom of page 60. Because Smoit wants to do what to him? To Gorion and Gast. Throw him in the dungeon. Even a lifetime in the dungeon will not raise one grain of wheat on a ruined field. Eden has lost all he hoped to gain, one harvest to keep himself and his wife alive. That is, without this harvest, they're dead. You offered me a favor. Here it is. Can I claim it now? Whatever. Terrence says, 
Set Gaston Gorey on free. What? Are you crazy? Set him free to labor beside Eden and strive to mend what they have destroyed. Gast. I took him for a hero. Him who? Eden. I took him for a hero, but he's no more than a lout. What he means by that? It's common laborer. How dare he ask Gast the generous to delve the ground like a mole and for no reward. Okay? Gorion says, no, I'm not going to do that. Terrence says, okay. Then you pass judgment on yourselves. This is what remains of Eden's livelihood. As well take a sword and slay him. Look on this, Lord Gorion, for there is more truth here than in your tales of giants and monsters. Here's your giant. And this he treasured, Lord Gast, more than you treasure any of your possessions. And Smoit says... Lad has a better head on his shoulders than I do, and his judgment is wiser. Kinder, too. So, Terran turns to Smoit and says, Oh, but I'm not done yet. This is just part of the favor. Here's the rest. Grant most where need is greatest. You claim Cornillo for your own, you know, this, this great cow. Give her to Eden. In other words, he's telling Smoit, Make Gorion and Gast give up what? And then something for Smoit to give up to. To give up their pride. To humble themselves. Okay? And then he's asking Smoit to give up his most valued possession. The cow. Give up my prize of war? And he says, so be it. Eden shall keep her. And Gast and Gorion shall have her next calves. That is, this prize cow will mate, will produce two calves. Gast gets one, Gorion gets one. What of my herd? What of mine? Karen says, Gorion will divide the herds in equal portions. Well, Gast is like, no, no he's not going to divide my herd in equal portion. Gorion will divide the herds, but Gast will get to choose which half he wants. It's pretty smart. Okay? That way, Gorion's not going to necessarily load this herd all up with the best cattle. Smoy, good job. Gorion divides, Gast chooses. And then Eden says to Terran, who you may truly be, I do not know. But you befriended me far better than I befriended you. Because what is he just, what if Terry just ensured? One, Eden and his wife will live. But they'll also live and they'll have, quote unquote, riches the next season. Okay? So, Terran says, if I did rightly, top of 63. Gast and Gorion will be waiting for Canillo's calves. Gast said they were always twins. Hope so. Smoit says, just past the middle of that page, from this day I'll try my hand at speaking instead of smiting. And yet, lad, my wits are slow. I need no man to tell me that. I'm easier in my mind when I have a blade in my hand. So he says, okay, so will you give me a favor now? Stay with me. Terran, I, I need to find out who my kinsmen are. Enough of me to make all the kinsmen you could want. What's he mean? Adopted. I will adopt you. And then what? You'll be king. Notice, not a prince. He'll be a king. What does that make him eligible for? I long wait. So, stay lad, and you shall one day be king of Canafor. Terran like, yes. The honor you would give me, page 64, there is nothing I would value more highly. Notice it's honor he would give him. Okay? I long to accept it. But I would rather hold kingship by right of noble birth. 
but he can't make Karen noble by birth, can he? That in truth I am nobly born, he says, that's what I want to find out. If that should prove the case, yeah, I'll come back and rule Catafort. That is, let me go wander around, let me see if I can find my parents. If I am nobly born, then I'll come back and rule. But he says also there's this. It is in my heart to learn the truth about myself. I will not stop short of it. Were I to do so, who I truly am would forever be unknown. And through all my life, I would feel a part of me lacking. So, Smoit says, seek it out. Come back and you'll be welcome. All right? Chapter 6. They go on. Find a frog. Kaw finds a little packet. Okay? We're going to skip a bunch. The frog turns out to be Dolly. Chapter 7, Friends in Danger. Uh, let's see. Dolly tells them about how the fair folk are in danger from a uh, wizard named Morda. Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch again. They find the thing in the packet or wrapped up is a finger bone. Chapter eight, we go to the Wall of Thorns. I'm gonna skip a bunch again. Uh, skip a bunch again, and pick up with when they get captured. Okay. Pages ninety and ninety-one. Karen tells them they're trying to get to the Lagardar Mountains. Um, Morta says, you've injured yourselves. That is, you should have gone around here. Taryn recognizes the emblem of the House of Lear, page 91. And Morta says, the Princess Angharad is long dead. All its secrets are mine. Who was the Princess Angharad? Ailanu's mother. Okay. And... Taryn says, Arlan, we never knew her mother's fate, but it was you at your hands. At your hands, she met her death. And then Morta gives us kind of his, uh, his, not explanation of the value of human life, but his treatise on what humanity is. Bottom of page 91. Think you the life or death of life or death of one of you feeble creatures should concern me. I've seen enough of the human kind, have judged them for what they are, lower than beasts, blind and witless, quarrelsome, caught up in their own small cares. They are eaten by pride and senseless striving. They lie, cheat, and betray one another. Yes, I was born among the race of men, a human, but long have I known it isn't my destiny to be one with them. In other words, I've risen above. I am no longer a mere human. It's almost like he's saying, I am a superman. Not the guy in tights, but the old Nietzschean idea from the German, an Ubermensch. I'm no longer bound by the laws, the customs, the morality of ordinary human people. Okay? So he goes on. As I would not debase myself to share their lives, neither would I share their deaths. Alone I studied the starts of arts of enchantment. From the ancient lore I learned the fair folk had held certain gems, blah, 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 blah. He talks about Angered, when she arrived, what she had with her. Her life, page bottom of 92, was worth no more to me than the book of empty pages I found among her why was the book of pages empty? Because he didn't have the pen lyric or whatever you call it, the bob. So he goes on, page 93, and says, when Taryn calls him heartless, heartlessness, evil, those words are toys for creatures such as you. In other words, heartlessness, evil, 
They don't apply to me. Why? I'm no longer human like the rest of you. At the end of the first book in the Harry Potter series, Harry's talking with Lord Voldemort. And, excuse me, with, with Quirrell, who has Lord Voldemort in the book Rubbish on the back of the book. And Quirrell tells Harry that his master taught him much about good and evil, about the foolish ideas of good and evil. And he says, there is no such thing as good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. There is no such thing as good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. To me, these words, heartlessness and evil, they mean nothing to me. My powers have borne me beyond my worth. The book served to make a fool taste his folly, but the jewel, the jewel served me. With the gem's help, he raised the wall of thorns and blah, 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 blah. Okay? He talks about how he captured Doi. He says, you know, all of Perdane will come under my spell. Page 95. They talk about Dalbin. He calls him a dotard, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Mordra is getting ready to put a spell on Terran. He's already done the others. And page 99, Mordra tries, tries to hurt Terran, and he can't. And we're told he, Terran, middle of the page, was aware now for the first time that the hand of Morda lacked a little finger. In its place was an ugly stump of scarred and withered flesh. Okay. Morda says, one last power I had, what did I do? He put his life in that piece of bone. So he couldn't be killed without that thing present. And Terran thinks, hmm, a finger. Morda, page 100. What do you hold, Pink Keeper? Give it into my hands, because he realizes he can't kill Terran. Okay. Terran says, it's a worthless thing, page 101. Your life I hold in my hand. So, the finger gets broken, Morta gets destroyed, and Leon comes in. I'm going to skip a bunch of them. Go on to Terrence says he won't take the stone of Rigat because it's evil now. He gives it to uh, Dolly and pick up with Dolly says page 112. Because they're now just kind of getting around to where, you know, Taryn wants to go to. And Dolly says, middle of page 112. As for the mirror you speak of, never heard of it, but there's a lake of Lunit in the Logadar Mountains. Okay. Says I can't tell you more than that. Um, Taryn shows him the horn that Ilanwi gave him, and Dolly says, that thing still works. And so he explains about what the horn will do. The horn will call for help, but it's only got one blow left, so to speak. Bottom of 113. The horn serves whoever happens to have it, in this case you. I've done nothing but show you how to gain a little more use from something already yours. Okay. Chapter 11. Uh, we see Dorath. Okay. Um, Taryn doesn't really want to spend night with him. He makes a wager with Dorath. Dorath cheats. Okay. And Taryn is surprised. They leave. Let's pick up where are we? Ch uh, chapter 13. 
checked out. Page, what did you check? One, three, four. He meets Craddock. Okay. The guy's got a lost lamb, Karen finds. Mank says it's his. Um, he goes off to stay at Craddock's farm, essentially for the night. Page 135, we get a description of the home. The farmstead Terran saw to be a tumble-down cottage whose walls of stone delved from the surrounding fields had partly fallen away. Half a dozen ill-shorn sheep grazed over the sparse pasture, a rusted plow, a broken-handled mattock, a scant number of other implements lay in an open-fronted shed. In the midst of the high summits, hemmed in closely by thorny bush and scrub, the farm stood lorn and desolate, yet clung doggedly to its patch of bare ground. Okay? So, that's his home. Craddock invites him in. Why does Alexander give us that description? What's it tell us about Craddock? Louder. Okay. What else? Notice he's got nothing, really. Farm implements are rusted or broken, so he can't be a good farmer. The house is falling down. And yet, he still invites them in. He shows them hospitality and such. He goes on and explains, it wasn't always this way. He said, you know, there used to be other people around here. They left. Bottom of 136. And Terrence says, but you stayed. You stayed here in a ruined land. Why? Craddock lifts his head. To be free. To be my own man. Freedom was what I sought. I had found it here, and I had won it. Okay? And what does he have now? He has his freedom, right? What does he have with it? Pretty much nothing. In other words, he wanted to be free. He wanted to be, in a sense, I'm not saying this literally, he wanted to be you know, his own man, he wanted to live independently of others. But can he? Okay. So, Taryn says, I haven't found what I seek yet. You have found what you seek. Taryn tells the others, I'm going to help him for a while. Okay. So, that evening, page 138-39, Craddock tells him a story. But he doesn't say, you know, here's the story. It's, you know, here's how it kind of came to be where I am, etc. And he talks about Dalbin and Dalbin bringing a boy, etc., etc. And Terrence says, You're my father? So, Fluter leaves, Gurgi stays, and Taryn stays and works. And he works, and he works, and works, and works. Works till his fingers bleed, more or less. Okay. And let's skip 32. Winter comes. Craddock falls down a kind of a cliffside, 152, 153. Gurgi runs and gets Terran, and we're told a figure, top of 152, a figure, arms outflung, lay motionless, one leg twisted under his body, partly covered with fallen stones. Terran sees this, and we're told grief struck him like a sword, but then beyond his will, terrifying in its sudden onrush, a wild sense of freedom flooded him. In one dizzying glance, he seemed to see his cage of stone crumble. What's his cage of stone? Craddock's home. Because what's Terran now thinking? Dad's dead. I don't have to stay here anymore. And then Craddock raises an arm. So he and Gurgi, you know, Try to debate, how do we go down and get him? His hands are shaking. It was not despair that filled him, but terror 
black terror at the thoughts whispering in his mind. Was there the slimmest hope of saving their stricken herdsmen? If not, then even Gwydion wouldn't grieve, uh, wouldn't reproach Terran's decision. In other words, Terran's thought, you know, is it worth Gurgi and I risking our lives and possibly dying to save his life, three lives dead, instead of maybe just one? You know, like, sorry, Craddock, uh, we can't get down there. And then he thinks, what man am I? And he gets down there. And Craddock says, you have lost your life for me. In other words, how are you going to get back up? Now you're dead too. Terran, not so. We'll find a way. Gurgi says he can find a path upwards. Middle of 154. Craddock says, leave me. Terran, leave you what some forsakes his own flesh and blood. Save yourselves. You're my father. No. Do as I ask and go from here. Heed me now or it will be too late. The duty of kinship, you owe me none. No bond, bond of blood holds you. So after Terran's been working there, fall, winter, Craddock fesses up. I'm not really your father. Never I've been false to any man save once to you. Okay? He says, there was no child. Craddock says, yes, there was. Our firstborn son. Nothing to do with Dalvin, it's not you. Right? So, Craddock says, 155, go from here. He falls back to the stone. Terrence's hand drops to his side. And there's the boy. Pretty hopeless situation, right? How's he going to get out of this one? He's got one note of the horn left. Okay? He blows the horn, and we're told, you know, whatever page that is, 156, the signal, it was answered, Gurgi, the summons come, good old Dolly, and Craddock is dead. Chapter 16, we get the chapter from which the title of the novel comes, okay? Fluter arrives. And Terran tells Fluter what he was going to do. And middle of 159, Fluter says, Each man has his moment of fear. As Terran said just before that, I was going to leave. Each man has his moment of fear. If we all behaved as we often wished to, there'd be sorry doings in Prydain. Count the deed, not the thought. Because what was the thought? Get up and leave. But he didn't do it. He stayed. Terran, in this I count my thought as much. It was not fear that held me back. Well, you know the truth? I was ashamed to be baseborn, so ashamed it sickened me. I would have left Craddock to his death, left him to die, because I believed it would have set me free of him. I was ashamed to be the son of a herdsman. He says, but not anymore. Now my shame is for myself. Why? Because I was ashamed to be lowborn. But he's not anymore. And he tells Fluter, I'm not going to look for the mirror. Why? I don't need to see who I am. He thinks he knows who he is. Not a coward, not someone willing to take on a fight. A coward in the sense of someone not willing to acknowledge who he is. Okay? Fluter says, you've got your health back, but man, you've lost your wits. My quest has brought, Terran says, 160. My quest has brought only grief to all of you. And for me, it's led not to honor, but to shame. Shame how? Because he was ashamed of thinking that he was lowborn, even though now he's not lowborn, so to speak, or he doesn't know at least. He says, Terran, Terran makes me sick at heart. I long to be of noble birth, long for it so much, I believed it was true. A proud birthright was all that counted for me. Those who had none, 
Even when I admired them, as I admired Eden, as I learned to admire Craddock, I deemed them lesser because of it. I thought of them as being lower than me because they did not have a noble birth. Without knowing them, I judged them less than what they were. Now I see them as true men. Noble? They were far nobler than I. And yet, low-born. I'm not proud of myself. I may never be again. If I do find pride, I'll find it in what I was or what I am. Not in what I was or what I am, but what I may become. Not in my birth, but in myself. What's the quote-unquote, the lesson he's learned? Here's another line from the Harry Potter stories. Dumbledore says, It's not what someone is born, but what they come to be that matters the most. Because we have all kinds of people in those stories who were born, quote-unquote, in nobility. And yet they're rotten as obese. And we have other people who are born not in nobility, and they are noble and courageous and such. Okay? So Taryn says, I'm not going back home. I can't face Dalvin. I can't face Call. I must make my own way, earn my own keep. Page 161. Somehow the robin must scratch for his own word, own worms. And he remembers Ordu saying that. Ordu said that. I heard them only with my ears. And now I understand. What's he mean? How's he got to scratch for his own worms? He's got to be his own man. Really be his own man. Has he been his own man so far? No. He stayed at Craddock's. He stayed at Eden's. He stayed at Smoit's, etc. Now he's got to go learn to fend for himself. Fluter says, yeah, that's true, but, you know, everyone should have a skill. That is, everyone should figure out what they're good at, their purpose in life kind of a thing. Okay? So, Terrence says, I'll go on to the free commands. And it says, bottom of 161, and we'll stop here, and I will scorn no man's welcome, high or low. If they give me welcome, I will accept it. Okay, we'll stop there. We um, we might finish this on Wednesday. Probably not, because there's a few passages we're going to get bogged down in.